that's it, man. The money is just literally one tiny piece of a puzzle. If you're a complete and utter mess, you're going to do that. You're going to sell, make, and smoke crack like Mark Lanigan and Lane, and you're going to lose all your money. That's just what's going to happen. <laughs> Welcome to Every Album Ever with Mike and Ox. My name is Mike Monsoor, and I'm joined, as always, once again, over technology by my lovely, wonderful co-host, Alexander Volt. Say hello. Hello. This is Every Album Ever. The- <laughs> this is Every Album. I'll explain in a second. This is Every Album Ever, the podcast we listen to every single album in the world, one artist at a time. That's a whole new discography per episode. And today, we'll be discussing the every one album by... Mad Season. Mad Season. This is the first single easy peasy album discography we've done in a long time because as you can tell, I am not in the same room as Alex and he's not in the same room as me. And it's a long story. It's a whole thing. Um, Schedules got mixed up. I got tied up. I'm in a place uh, very far away from my home and uh, I don't know if I'll be coming back anytime soon. Uh, I'll be coming back soon, but I'll be back here again. Um, We're figuring things out. And, And because of that, we just spent the last hour re- re-remembering how to do this over yes. Skype. <laughs> Fucking nightmare. <laughs> sucks, dude. It sucks. Uh, but we're talking about Mad Season. And do you, do you know them? Do you, have you listened to them before? I have never listened to them before. And never. Uh, you know, you're out and about doing your thing. And uh, I, I was like, you you let me pick. And I was like, yep. you know what? It's been a while since we've done some grunge, and uh, this seems to fit the bill of what we've done, what we do here. I've I've never listened to the album before, and uh, yeah, that is exactly that. We've done a lot of grunge here. Please check it all. We have a whole playlist actually for grunge stuff. So look at that on the YouTube. I'm gonna bold bold guess. Alex doesn't like them. I do like them actually. Shut the fuck up. Why do you? <laughs> what? <laughs> How could you um, like this and not Temple the Dog, you son of a bitch? <laughs> I wasn't expecting this to be like jammy and spacey and trippy. And uh trippy? It does- Where's the trippy? Sorry, 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 go on. Yeah, it's in there. We'll get to it when we get to okay. the songs. But um there is some blues stuff, but it wasn't it didn't feel as excessive as Temple of the Dog. Um I felt I, it more. Incredible. You felt it more. More. I felt it more. I I will say I think Temple of the Dog is more polished, like a a proper band. Yeah. This does have uh like you know a side band vibe to it, but as just this little part of growing history, if you will, I was I was impressed. This is just how it fucking always happens with us, where <laughs> I love one thing and you don't like it, and then the, it's, it's happened with Embrace and Rights of Spring, where I'm a huge <laughs> Embrace guy, and you were, and I, I wasn't too big on Rights of Spring, even though I still yeah. like them. Uh, this keeps happening. Uh, I, I'm making it sound like I hated this. I didn't hate this at all. I think it's it's mm-hmm. still a good album, um, but. Uh, Overall, it's just like it's just so Pearl Jammy, and I have my I have a lot of problems with Pearl Jam, even though I'm I love grunge, and uh, I don't know. There's something about it felt like uh, I don't know. I like I like some songs that I'm gonna give it up to, but there's a lot mm-hmm. of it that fucking bored the shit out of me. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's uh, it is this interesting group. Um. Not as interesting as Mother's Love Bone. I think that... You mean Mother Love Bone? Uh, Mother Love Bone. Um, yeah. That is this, like, the zaniest, like, Pearl Jam adjacent band. Um, yeah. I think I was just expecting something that leaned more into Ale- uh, Alice and Chains. And yeah. this was, like, a little bit off the beaten path. It doesn't do anything revolutionary i wouldn't say like oh my god like you've never heard of you never listened to that mad season album yeah. but as a allison shane's fan and i i just thought it was a, a neat little neat little album yeah it's it's not like a you can't just say it's a if you like allison shane's or like this it's like if you like lane staley you like this probably because uh, yes. only a couple couple moments i felt it, it felt super allison chainsy 
uh, mm-hmm. although Lane always sounds like like Lane. Um, this album I have a a little bit of history with my. I, I mean, I I go way too too far back with Allison Chains, and I was a wee little boy, and this one came around a little bit later. I heard this album in like the background of my house during like the most chaotic, dangerous, awful years of my childhood. <laughs> so like that's, part of it's that's like, the way it always is with albums with you. I suppose you're right. <laughs> but the difference is this wasn't my band. This was my brother's band. And yeah. I, I would always hear it like in the background somewhere. Uh, and I didn't care much for it then. Um, and going back to it now, uh, I like it way more now for sure than mm-hmm. I did back then. But uh i don't know there's uh, i feel like if i liked pearl jam more I'd like this it doesn't like it's not like it sounds like pearl jam it's just it feels closer to pearl jam than Alice in chains yeah um you've used the term fan maker before i don't think this is like a fan maker by by any means this is no kind of like if you if you really appreciate and love those like big four grunge bands or even three out of the four the way I do. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was uh, way more like mellow than I was expecting. So Very mellow. Yeah. Uh, but we have a little bit of history here from our history man, Tom Osmond, who should all go and follow because he does a bunch of work for us and he's a very nice fellow. Um, there's like a, it's not like a, he's not an like extensive history, but he, uh, there's a general backstory. It's all very sad, by the way. But uh, he also got some quotes from Mark Lanigan from from his from his memoir ugh, from his memoir, "Sing Backwards and Weep," uh, which I've I've neglected Mark Lanigan and Screaming Trees my entire life, never on purpose, just didn't get around to it. And now I'm like itching. I I need more of this guy. Full, I I really want to listen to Screaming Trees. Full confession, I probably like read he died and then like forgot about it and and then i was reading this i was like what the hell i was we did the the new queens of the stone age album i'm out here talking about him like he's alive like an idiot oh yeah he died last year yeah yeah he he, he just died yeah so i don't know if i like heard and then forgot about it or or what i did with that information but rereading it again i was like god damn it yeah yeah that's one of he's just one of those names um he's just such such an important guy for that whole time period and not once did i come across screaming trees i I mean other than the name which is uh, Mm -hmm. embarrassing embarrassing but yeah um he has a lot of stories he was very close to lane before he died and spoiler alert it gets very sad but uh yeah a little bit of backstory here um it is a side project it's a little it's a it's sort of a super group um made up of of course lane staley from allison chains on vocals mike mccready of pearl jam on guitar john baker saunders on bass who would later be a bassist in the walkabouts and drummer from screaming trees barrett martin and uh and mark mark lanagan would would contribute some vocals on the album as well as some lyrics and he would guest, he was a guest vocalist in, in, in some shows, like I think it was after Lane died. So he's always just kind of been a, a, a strongly associated with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they, and they formed f- f- from rehab? <laughs> I believe they formed out of rehab. This is, yeah, the most grunge origin story ever. Of all time. Yeah, so it was McCready who met, he met, he met G- yeah, Saunders. He met him in, in rehab. Then he got he got um, Martin in there. But they, I think, <laughs> I guess McCready apparently he hope he brought in Lane, hoping that being around sober musicians would push him to get sober. And <laughs> well, I mean, fuck that that didn't happen. But it, it's man, I didn't know. I never knew so many. I never knew any like the stories or the details of the years before Lane died. Because mm-hmm. I didn't realize that his last show was like 96 with Alice in Chains. Yeah. And that was his last performance ever. And that was a good, that's a good mo- minute before he died. So there was a yeah. whole lot in between there. Uh, a very lengthy and brutal downward spiral there. So yeah, that's basic. I mean, there's not much backstory, much more backstory than that. We might as well jump into the album itself and do all the stuff and the whatnots. You ready yep. for that? I am Hell ready. yes. So they got the one album that came out in 1995, and there, here it is. Shit, I didn't pull it up because this is usually Alex's job. God damn it. Hold on, hold on. Here we go. This not is, today. Not today. This is 1995's Above. And 
is the, the tiniest, quietest bass line. And this song takes like three years to start. It does, which I thought they were going to come out swinging. And uh, it does not. Yeah, yeah, it's got these um, these vibes on there. Marimbas or whatever the hell you they are. Um, yeah, very uh, reminiscent. Yeah, very reminiscent of like Led Zeppelin, No Quarter, or uh, Black Sabbath's Planet Caravan. Those are like the big two, I think. Of. Oh yeah, you're not wrong. I think those are significantly better in every possible way. But I get the vibe is very similar. I'm here. I'm here for the vibe. I, yeah, I'm here for the vibraphone. Vibraphone. That there we go. Yeah. This song is like so, you know, seven plus minutes, and it takes a real minute to get going. But it, I'm, I'm reminded every time I hear it that I do like it. Oh, nope, I'll shut up. Because that Yarl. This isn't like a, a a perfect representation of the album, but it's a good it's a good fifty percent of the albums is like this. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. It's it's weird. It's not a, a hard album to pin down by any means, but I think there's enough. For, well, for me, there's enough variety on the album to get me through it. Uh, we should also say we're doing like the deluxe version where you get the the Lanigan tracks yeah thrown on there but. yeah yeah he does sound great he always sounds fucking great Actually, I like the the guns blazing openers, but uh, yeah, as a softer like opener, this this works for me. Yeah. All right, I got some in my eyes, things in my eyes, shit. Uh, so that song it does get louder than that. It just takes a long time, mm-hmm. and. I don't like it as an opener at all. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a fine song. I think it's a fine song. But holy shit. <laughs> I mean, especially when you get the, the fucking follow up. Oh, what the hell is the follow up called? X ray mind. X ray mind. Which, yes. honestly, I don't feel like that's a, a you know, a, an opener song either, but it feels way more like what you would kind of expect. Um, it's got way more energy. And I, I, man, that song takes me back. Who boy. Does it? Oh, yeah. I remember that song quite a bit. I like, I like those two songs together because you have this like dreamy like soft psychedelic stuff and then x-ray mind has this you know opens up with these tribal drums if yeah. that's what they're called and you get more like flanger guitar yeah. to me it's this nice surreal blend of like grunge hard rock and more dreamy stuff which which I feel like isn't really done that often mm-hmm. in the in the grunge music scene. You would think it would, but I, off the top of my head, there's probably a million examples. But in my in my world, off the top of my head, I can't think of too many. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially with the, I don't know. There's something about the way this one's produced too, where when I think of grunge, I think dirty. I mean, that's mm, how it started sure. out anyway. It wasn't until Nevermind that things started getting super clean, mm-hmm. but uh, this is produced like a blues album. It's produced like a like a hard rock album when it gets loud, where the vocals are so super fucking pointed and up front and louder than everything else, and everything else is really shiny. Um, the bass and drums kind of uh, hold everything together, and guitar is like ambient a little bit in, mm-hmm. in, on the periphery. It sounds really nice for like the you know the like the opener wake up and a lot of the other quieter songs it does sound really good but for for the heavier songs which i 
the, I mean, every almost every heavy song on here I do like a lot. I think they're some of the best songs here. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. They, they don't punch. They don't fucking crunch. They don't kick. They don't have any kind of oomph because of that production. It's too bluesy. I think that's a, a fair assessment. Um, maybe they just felt like the rest of the album was so so jammy that maybe this by the nature of these these heavy songs that they would they would kick more but um Mm -hmm. yeah i think that i think that's fair you know you put a a lifeless dead against like a a man in the box it probably doesn't doesn't hit as hard definitely doesn't hit as hard although i probably controversial take i probably let take lifeless dead over man in the box you know i'm not talking I'm not talking about song song quality here. This this production, <laughs> this production. I do. I'm, I am biased, but I definitely do like Lifeless Dead quite a bit. Um, no, it's like I I think they're both great songs. Just to uh, drive home your production point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, on a, also on a speaking. S- go ahead. Oh, totally. Side note: If anyone's seen the Barbie movie. Ryan Gosling is a great Yarl. Oh, I've not seen it. I now I only want to see it because of that. I want him just doing Yarls on an album. I think it would really be fucking hilarious. <laughs> God damn it! Now I have, to, I have to fucking watch the Barbie movie. Yeah, now uh, you got to watch Ryan Gosling sing Matchbox Matchbox Twenties Push. Oh my God! Oh, all right, he, sold. Fucking. <laughs> nails it in the most like hilarious way possible but that's my yarl yarl rant bravo bravissimo uh sp- actually speaking of life lifeless dead and alice in chains uh the most characteristic alice in chains thing in the world is the their harmonies the, they, use, they use perfect ugh, perfect fifth harmonies which is just a power chord if you're a guitar player mm-hmm. that's like every that's almost every harmony that Alice in Chains does, or at least like the ones that when you think of Alice in Chains harmonies, you think of that one. Um, they're all over Lifeless Dead, all over. And I'm I'm so fucking tired of that that harmony. It's just like I get it. You're Lane Staley. You do that thing, <laughs> but yeah. it's still. I mean, it's cool. If and now it's 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 gotten to the point where I think if anyone else does it, they'll be like they'll probably get attributed to like oh you were heavily inspired by Alice in Chains kind of thing. So that's it's cool. the Alice in Chains harmony now. Yeah, it's basically what it is. One of the few moments on the album that I think was like that's super Alice in Chainsy is. Uh, there's a section on two minutes 30, um, but still one of my favorite songs here. Man, I don't know anything. It's got to be the most 90s grunge thing ever, uh, especially I, that main riff, which I love, by the way. Yeah, I still love it. Um, the most interesting section of that song is probably, I didn't timestamp it, but a certain point the percussion is like, sounds like they're banging on like pipes and all sorts of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. It's not, you know, brutal in the way uh swans or maybe like a mm-hmm. heavier mike mike um sorry tom waits i'm all I'm yeah all tongue tied. oh yeah it's not like heavy in that way but it's still like a cool little little add yeah. on there the song is like that that I, I would kind of crave chunkier production uh, uh i do like that song it's super bitter it's super solid but man that's a good example of basically every song in here is fucking five minutes at least and it's it feels pretty unnecessary with with songs like that, where with, with songs that are just mean and and cr- mean and heavy, um, mm-hmm. it feels like I don't know. I, I kind of crave them to be shorter when they're they're juxtaposed with these long jammy songs, uh, but instead they're just all so long. <laughs> so it's not even like boring. Well, I, I don't know because it's like it's not like they're meandering or jamming on the, on songs like I don't know anything. It's just first chorus first chorus first chorus like over and over again it's just like all right dude you have a lot of lyrics i get it fucking edit sorry 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 that's disrespectful he's dead but it's a simpler time mike was it was it simpler alex how simple was it no it was it wasn't because we've covered crazy crazy bands from the 90s that is true we've covered a lot of 90s bands um so Uh, go ahead oh i while we're on that part of the album I and jammy songs long day gone is just like coffee shop grunge mean long gone day oh yeah, yeah sorry yeah. um and I love it there's yeah. bongos there's yep. saxophones it and it works sure does that's my favorite song on the album that's that one oh yeah so that one has like the best story about it too because that that's um 
That's Mark Lanigan singing lead on kind of trading with Lane singing lead. Mm-hmm. And they wrote it together. And there's a quote from, from Mark that I got here. It's so wild what this song led to. This song and him being a part of this song, what this led to, it's fucking ridiculous. So so what happened was was Lane invited Mark to the studio saying that he wanted to write a song with him. They kicked out producer uh, Brett Eliason. And Lane said, let's write a song. You write a line, then I'll write one and we'll just do it like that. So Mark says, he played the music in the background and we began. He wrote a line, handed me the paper, and then I write one and hand it back to him. Whatever one of us wrote informed the other of what the next line would be. It was a cool and interesting exercise. Neither of us had ever written this way. When the lyrics were done, he hit record on the tape machine and we got it in one go. All in all, it took us 45 minutes to write and record a song we called Long Gone Day. When it came out later that year, Mad Seasons Above became a big selling album with a bona fide hit single, River of Deceit, in which we will talk about that song in a second. Uh, and he says, around six months after its release, I started getting large, totally unexpected royalty checks in the mail. To my shock, the guys had given me full royalty points on the record. Since it went gold, that meant a shitload of cash was coming my way. I couldn't believe it. I did stuff on people's records all the time, and you were usually just doing it for friends, not expecting anything in return. What these guys had given me for less than two hours of less than two hours time time that that was spent having fun, not working, wasn't heard of in my world. An extremely classy and generous move. I was eternally grateful. Uh, and then he says, <laughs> I found out uh, where the checks are coming from at Sony and made sure that they kept being sent directly to me, not my accountant. That was an exceedingly stupid and foolish move, but <laughs> such was my desperation for money at the time. I couldn't bear to let the tax man have a cut. It was a decision that would come back to seriously bite me in the ass. It bites him in the ass. <laughs> the tax man comes. All right, dude, the tax man always comes. Yep. <laughs> So the tax man came. <laughs> so when he when he was finally caught, he says after almost a year at eleven. Oh, when what year was this? This was a long time after. Sometime later. Yeah, this is a good a good amount of time later. Uh, he says after almost a year at live-in treatment facilities and halfway houses in California, much of it funded through the continued kindness and generosity of Courtney Love. Check out our episode on Hole. Um, and Nirvana, sure. Uh, I was tracked down by, de- by detectives from the criminal branch of the IRS, still newly clean. It was a shock to find out that I was facing significant prison time for tax evasion. The back taxes on those mad season royalty checks I had hidden from my accountants years before had ballooned with penalties and interest accrued to almost a half a million bucks. Holy a tax shit. Attorney got the- oh, yes. A tax attorney got them to drop it to 50 grand cash, and I was given a month to come up with a payment. First of all, hold on. That's the shadiest shit ever when the government's like, all right, just give me, just give us 50 grand in, cra- in cash. <laughs> That's the shadiest shit ever. Uh, dealing with a few collection agencies, some of them are just, yeah, you can do that sometimes if your medical bills have gotten out of hand. If you get the right person and you're just like, look, I got, I got $5. I'm oversimplifying, but. I got five dollars yeah. to my name. Do you want it? And they'll just take it and call it a day. Jesus, I mean, this is America. We, we run. We, we are all criminals, and we're run by criminals. They, uh, so they're fucking caponing Mark Lanigan. <laughs> They're caponing Mark Lanigan. So he said. He, he says, uh, I might as well have tried to swim underwater from Japan to Australia, holding my breath as to get that much dough together. At zero hour, my producer friend from Houston, Randall Jamail, stepped in. His publishing company offered me a songwriting deal for that exact amount, and the check went directly to the government. That's how we got out of that jam that was set up years and years before with this song. <laughs> this one song. It's fucking amazing. Ooh, it's it's crazy hearing about people who have success and just that shit doesn't last. That's it, man. The money is just literally one tiny piece of a puzzle. If you're a complete and utter mess, you're going to do that. You're going to fucking make and you're going to sell, make and smoke crack like Mark Lanigan and Lane and you're going <laughs> to lose all your money. That's just what's going to happen. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Drugs are expensive. Anyway, the song's cool. I like the song. The song is, uh, yeah, really awesome. Yeah, it's it's the most different thing on the album. It's very hippy dippy in a way. And I never, since I never listened to Screaming Cheese, I never really appreciated Lanigan's voice. I love his voice. Yeah, his his voice is great. Um, segueing into the like bonus tracks, if you will. I think oh, right. 
I think for Queens of the Stone Age fans, uh, Black Black Book of the uh, Black Book of Fear is kind of a cool song because you can see the influence Lanigan had on Queens of the Stone Age, where where it's crazy because as we've documented, Josh is such like a strong dominating presence, and for Lanigan to kind of have his signature style and and offer it up in in queens of stone age is impressive that is big he was on how many albums was he on i know he's on like a bunch he's on, he's like, on a bunch the big yeah. ones yeah at least the big ones um rated r and songs for the deaf yeah most uh, most of the albums minimum he'll have like an appearance so yeah um uh, i could actually couldn't stand black book of fear um, not not for me. The same with Slip Away. I didn't like that one, but I I, would, I did like Locomotive quite a bit, though. Yeah, um, Locomotive is the strongest track. I think Black Book of Fear does go into that that blues territory. Sure um, does. Slip Away. I think the the guitar solos kind of help that stand out from the other ones. They're big, powerful, echoey really like dominant guitars on slip away so mm-hmm. uh so back to the main the main record uh this is a rec- recorded mixed and co-produced by Brett, um alias eliasin which i who i mentioned earlier um who's in benigna house with tom morello check out our rage gets machine episode from a fucking million years ago and audio uh, slave and audio slave yeah how for, could i forget that one um where the time was, goes i know i know he also worked um He's part of the, te- the technical team for Pearl Jam's Vitology, um, recorded Screaming Trees of Dust, makes a bunch of the, uh, those endless bootleg slash not bootleg live albums Pearl Jam released according to, to our boy Tom. Um, it was mastered by Howie Weinberg, who mastered over 2,000 records, including Nirvana's Nevermind, check out that episode, uh, Ella Cool J's Mom's to Knock You Out, Smashing Pumpkin's Melancholy, Madonna's Music, and Yaya's yeah, yeah, Show Your Bones. Homeboy has got some credits. Jesus Christ. Where do you, where do you even find... I'm assuming mastering albums doesn't isn't hard. <laughs> <laughs> Attack Alex for that, please. <laughs> if you've mastered over two thousand albums in your lifetime, well, it is a it's a so if I my some of the some of those he's not working as hard as the other ones. <laughs> yeah, for sure, I bet a lot of them. <laughs> mastering is interesting because. Uh, I won't touch mastering, but I'll mix. But mixing is harder. Mixing is a creative mm-hmm. process. Mastering is like a technical process. Yeah. Um. You you can put like, you can um like steer the sound. You can kind of control like broad, very broad strokes with mastering. Whereas mm-hmm. with mixing, you can make tiny little crazy turns. You can do anything with mixing. Mastering is like you have the finished thing, and you can kind of just shape it to to seem a certain way. Um, it's, and you have to, and the most important, the, the main thing that mastering does is just, it, it evens out everything. It levels everything out. It brings up the quiet parts to match the loud parts. So when you're, he- when you hear it, it all, all the dynamics match up, um, mm-hmm. without mastering, it just, it sounds like shit, but mixing is where all the creativity comes in. So also, I think mastering is probably an easier process, just a very different one. This man has more Grammys than, than anybody needs. That's <laughs> That's insane. Uh, really? Howie Weinberg, Howie Weinberg? I guess if you've done over 2,000 albums, you're bound yeah, to rack that's like, up a few, a few Grammys. That's just playing the lottery. That, that's He's playing the, that, that numbers game on that one. Hell yeah. <laughs> Jeez, man. Also, uh, but, yeah. Danzig 3, How the Gods Kill. <laughs> he, he did that one? He did, yeah. Check out that episode. Hell yeah. Fucking great album. Uh, right, although he did, maybe he did a bad job on that one. I didn't love the way that album came out. <laughs> <the> quality wise. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this, this album did very well. Uh, like we told in the story that Mark told that Mark Lanigan told, um, went gold, had a hit and the hit was river of deceit. What do you think of that song? Um, you know what? It's it's okay. It's not my least favorite. It's the most country twangy song on yeah. the album. If anything, that's like a misrepresentation of the album. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't like it. It could, it's catchy. It will I'll yeah. be humming it. If I hear it, I get it. Like I, I get it, but it's just, and it's very Pearl jammy. It's very guitar centric. It has that. I mean, it's Mike, uh, Mike McCready. He's, he is Pearl Jam, a Pearl Jam man. Mm-hmm. Uh, makes sense that he's playing it like that. But uh, that song really reminds me of Hunger Strike from Temple of the Dog. Not as in the way it sounds, but of the way that the type of song on this type of album, where it's like the the ballad song, the one that's um, kind of the most famous song on the album. Like Hunger Strike is probably the most famous Temple of the Dog song. Uh, and both and both those songs, I don't really care for. I don't really care for Hunger Strike all that much. <laughs> he uh, he knows he knows these super groups are going to need a hit single, and he just keeps them in his back pocket and uh, gets it out of the way, and then does the rest of the album. He's really good at that. Mike Mike is uh, really really good at that, even though <laughs> I don't like it personally. Uh, I'm above is the other song that Mark Lanigan sings on. I don't. He might he might sing on a third, but I think it's just those two. Uh, he's he's doing harmonize he's doing harmonies with Lane for like yeah. a, a good chunk of it. I find it a bit distracting. I think it's kind of a waste to have these you know two iconic voices, and it's it's by the numbers grunge. There's nothing nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing where you're like, oh my god, that's you know that's going on my mixtape. I think there's something wrong with it. The, at two fifteen, there the, the first section, the first time the section comes on, which it, it comes back, it is just a complete and utter helter skelter ripoff. I mean, <laughs> holy god, it stinks! I ca- I can't believe that's like the title track. Yeah, although I uh, I don't expect much from title tracks. <laughs> We've learned the hard way, I guess, many times on this yes, podcast. Yes, yes. And then yeah, I think I think artificial red is the other weak link here holy shit yes it is the most bluesy jammy song on the album it is a blues song it's through it and through. Is. holy and shit that, that is not that is not for me but that's like one song i can skip on an otherwise enjoyable coffee shop grunge <laughs> <laughs> it is it's coffee shop grunge that's exactly it what it ki- is it kind of yeah you know if you cut out lifeless dead and i don't know anything like throw yeah. this on on a at a starbucks no one's gonna no one's gonna say yeah. anything because even um november hotel which is like it's an instrumental and it's kind of lengthy it has a, some decent build and it gets kind of groovy even then it's not like hard or heavy i mean it's heavy i guess but it's not it doesn't really it's not like grunge heavy. It's just like, oh uh, yeah, it's nineties rock heavy. Yeah, it, it picks up and it gets gets rocking, but um yeah, November ho- that's a good example of like a type of, of jamming rock and roll that I enjoy more. Really? I mean it's a fine song. I don't I actually don't mind it. Um mm. I mean, especially when you compare it to like yeah, artificial red or something where I'm just I'm just complete off I'm I'm out, but uh, closes with all alone, which I get. I get it. I guess it's just not for me. I <laughs> it's it reminds me of like a a song like a, like an I don't want to say an African song, a song you would you would put on in a movie where they're visiting Africa. Mm, I went for uh when when someone is dies and they're they're entering the. The good, the good, <laughs> whatever good place is for you yeah. when you die. It's very uh, ethereal and dreamy, and that's it's exactly that as well. Uh, what I find jarring is, like I said earlier, how fucking loud the vocals are. They come in so loud, and it's this really super angelic, gentle, quiet thing, and then just comes in super loud it's fucking obnoxious you think it was just like we got lane stanley we're just gonna stanley <laughs> whatever i don't pronounce names he's correctly. dead who cares i've given up i'm i'm that old now i've given up saying names correctly um but yeah just like uh we got lane where that's what people are here for we're gonna we're gonna crank the vocals yeah i imagine this is i almost peak, i almost wonder if it's I almost wonder if it's like a remaster issue too. Like if you, if you just listen to the normal version, because mm, I, I, I know, know one, I know some remasters is just like an arms race to be loud instead of 
focusing on the intricacies and presenting it in the way that it should be. That's very true. Uh, yeah, most remasters, I don't know. I think most of them I'm fine with. And there's some that, that drive me crazy, like Alice in Chains Dirt, which I've mm-hmm. complained about in the past. Um, and there's some that, that kind of do it right. Like, sorry to mention Slint. Once again, check out that episode. When they remastered Spiderland, uh, the, most of it sounds like, you know, if you're not paying the super close attention, it sounds mostly the same. But on the opening track, you can hear... There, there's actually backup vocals in, in Breadcrumb Trail, uh, on the re- and you could hear it in the remastered version. You can't, you could basically not hear it at all in the original, which is interesting. The the funniest, most bullshit thing I've ever heard someone say about a remaster was, uh, you can you can hear them like you can hear like the board mix. I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> can you can hear the what? Like the board mixing when they're like messing with the knobs, and I'm like. The f- no, you fucking can't shut up. I feel the same about the people who, uh, who like. I think the 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 age old claim of vinyl versus whatever, it, high quality digital, for example, mm-hmm. where it's like, I think it mostly. I think the sound you're hearing is your record player, not necessarily the vinyl. I think that's that's kind of how I feel about that. Uh, throwing my hat into that conversation, there is like a warmth with vinyl i'm not a prude about it obviously you know i'm gonna listen to my streaming music because it's easy and accessible but there's just like a it's like uh it's like a good when you get like a a, a fire going on a, on a fireplace is, i i totally feel that the same way especially about the ritual of having to flip sides and giving your ears a, like a mini break there mm-hmm. i think th- i think there's been plenty of like uh you know, Pepsi taste test of, of vinyl, like and they, using the exact same sound system, testing the two, you're probably not going to distinguish the two. But I think um, with most people, you have your record player and that sounds way different than your stereo. Uh, in which for, case, I think it's, that's probably neat on its own. But For sure. Yeah. I'm in the camp of, I think there's a difference, but I'm not going to die on that hill by any means. Yeah. It's also just a fun hobby too. <laughs> the artwork is bigger. Um, I like looking at lyrics sometimes, and uh, yeah, yeah, it is much fun, much more fun. I'm, I'm I'm very tempted to start buying them again. I shouldn't, and I don't know if I will, but I might. If you if you if you stop traveling, I think you should. If you're That's traveling true. at the rate you're traveling, <laughs> then you absolutely should not. <laughs> I'll just yeah, I'll just carry 14 suitcases with me, all with you know. You'll be uh, like a, a Wes Anderson character in a movie. Oh, my God. Oh, God. A fate worse than death. <laughs> uh, what else do we got? That's basically it. I mean, the, yeah. the, the they, re, they remastered the, the album and they put out a bunch of bonus tracks and live tracks. And there's also the DVD. Uh, I forget what it's called. Live at the Moor. Ah, there we go. Uh, I'm actually curious to see that, too, because it's I mean, yeah. they... they, they Played so they did not really play. No, live not really all that much. I have a habit of buying live DVDs while we're recording, but not today. Not, not I today. will eventually, but not. Uh, the beautiful thing is, no what, no what. Well, there's kind of an uptick in physical media, but for the most part, people don't want them. So, like, you can get these concert. Like, I've never paid more than like five dollars on my impulse. Tim Buckley. Oh yeah. Oh, it was just the Buckley boys. Yeah. Tim and Jeff. Yeah. I was like, I need to s- didn't pay more than five dollars. It's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. So they they didn't they never really officially broke up until I guess there was an interview with Lane in like ninety nine where he confirmed it, but it was always like they couldn't get shit together. Everybody was busy. Lane was getting way, way, way worse. Uh, uh, how worse you asked? Well, uh, we have some what? more stories from Mark Lanigan here. <laughs> All right. And oh my God. <laughs> so this is, this is what he's, this is, this is what he, is what he's, he says when not developing songs with the, with the band, he mean, he's talking about screaming trees. Um, I continued making and selling crack whenever I was not working. Fuck. I was spending most of my free time smoking crack and shooting heroin around the clock with lane. Uh, 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 <laughs> I didn't realize.
realize Mark Lanigan was so cool. No, didn't know either, but now we do, and it gets worse. Uh, so he we went to go visit Lane at his place, and he says, uh, when I got there, I did our secret our secret personal sequence of knocks on the door. Already red flag. I mean, it's the most drugged up thing to have your own secret knock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah do you even says, do uh, drugs if you don't have a secret knock that's true that's i don't believe we do uh he says uh you did a sequence of uh, a sequence of knocks on the door and heard him shout from down the hall come in god damn it that in itself shocked me because he would never never leave the door unlocked i came in locked the door and cautiously called his name and he responded he said he was in the bathroom and he, he said he asked him why was the door unlocked bro he says, bro, it's, it's, it feels weird. People calling people bro in the nineties. I was yeah. like, bro. And he says, so I can get out of here in a fucking hurry. If I have to, uh, I entered the bathroom to, to the strange sight of him lying on his stomach on the floor, head behind the shitter, staring intently at a tiny hole in the wall. <gasps> What's going on, brother? Why would you have to get out of here? Quiet, man. They're back there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute and be quiet. They'll come out again. Who are they? He was, uh, I whispered back. The fucking spiders, man. I was asleep, and when I woke up, they were coming out of my arm. And apparently, hijinks ensued after that. Uh, oh, my God. So, yeah, I think he like he he convinced him to, to leave, and he lied to him and said that he was going to get the place fumigated or something. I mean, it's just... Holy shit. That holy is shit, dude. The most Philip K. Dick scanner darkly <laughs> story I've I've heard Dude, that, I mean, happened that, is, in real, that happened in real life. Yeah, it's it's full on crack psychosis. I mean, holy shit, dude. Uh, so um, he he did that deal with uh, Randall Jamel that helped him pay off the IRS. A few years later, he was uh, he was recording with him again. Uh, he, actually, no, he was in. A few years later, he was actually he made the deal with Randall who paid off the debt. And then a few years later, Randall cashed in on it. He's like, all right, here's the thing that I paid for. Here's the thing. So he was, he says he was, um, he was in Houston filling, fulfilling his end of the bargain. And he says one night in my room at the holiday Inn, I got a phone call from Lori Davis, my huge hearted, long suffering accountant, the only person from my time in the trees who continued to care enough to work with me. And she said, uh, Mark, please sit down. I'm so sorry. So sorry, but I have some terrible news and it's going to hurt. I'm so, so sorry. And he asked Lane. She said, yes, honey, he's gone. Uh, it was a call I expected for years, but it destroyed me nonetheless. His loss left a void. I felt ve- I felt every day since. I expect I always will. Uh, God damn. Yeah, Lane was 34, 2002. Man. Yeah, I've outlived Lane. Yep. Um, yeah, I didn't realize those two were so close either. So Neither did I. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, I remember when he. I remember when he died. It was a uh, the news rocked my home because of my brother. Although I everyone was, saw it coming, I was not really into Alice and Shane's yet. Mm-hmm. And you know, the most random performance did it for me. Um, I don't know what it was. It was one of those like made up VH1 award shows, and mm-hmm. it was Alice and Shane's with uh. Phil Ensemble, yeah. However you say his name, Ensemble, yeah, yeah. Doing wood, and there was this something about that where I was like, mm-hmm. "Do I like this band?" And then I went and this, I was like, "I do like this band." Ah, shit! Holy crap! Well, so, get another, yeah. What a bold choice! You have this like madman, and the song you picked is wood, and he and he killed it. I mean, he's a. He's a phenomenal vocalist. I, I fucking love Phil Anselmo. I really do. <laughs> he's, a, he's such an interesting guy. Uh, and a scary dude, but holy shit, he's a killer vocalist. But yeah, so each member kind of went on to do some stuff. Um, some of it ends sad as not surprising. John Baker Saunders had a heroin re- relapse and died from an overdose in 1999. And he was 44 then. Um, in 97, though, uh, Martin McCready and Saunders, they tried to revive Mad Season with a new singer. Didn't really pan out, obviously. And then they did some kind of, they did a couple of reunions. One of them was with Chris Cornell on vocals, I believe. Um, they had like Duff McKeegan in there also for another reunion. All of them sort of fizzled out. And some of them were like one-off performances with just like um, McCready and Martin, I believe. Uh, but yeah, Barrett, uh, Barrett Martin continued playing with Screaming Trees. 
um, well, when they were a band, of course, uh, went on to form uh, Twatara with Peter Buck of R.E.M. And then uh, Tom says, he says, uh, there have, of course, been a, a bunch of other projects, including his Barrett, Barrett Martin group. Um, he is a drummer after all. He was, and this is the most fucking mind-blowing, shocking, confusing part of it all. He was ordained as a Zen monk in 2000. Did not see that coming. Who could have? You, you, what, what? Is, it, is that not the most logical conclusion to a life of crack in heroin, though? I saw the crack spiders coming, but not the... Not the Zen monk? A, yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, shit. Uh, Tom notes here, he says, Mike McCready continued to rule the rock world of Pearl Jam, of course. Um, and has guested on many other projects, inc- projects including Soundgarden's King Animal, and he n- notes here, oh, yippee, because if you remember from our episode where I debated Tom in Germany, he did not like that album at all, and I did, so fuck you, Tom. Sorry, I'm kidding. I love you. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, of course, Lanigan died in 2022, and after being legendary and having a very successful st- solo, cl- solo career, working with Queens of Stone Age, and then in Screaming Trees, of course. Let me just say it's it's very rude of Mike McCready to re- remind people he's still alive by playing that song all the time. Oh, what's oh, I'm just, oh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm just I went for the low hanging fruit there. He, I mean, he did outlive everybody. I, I've been bragging still, too. He's technically still alive. <laughs> he sure is. He's doing well. I mean, he got clean pretty pretty early on, so good for him. Yeah, that's one of the things that Lanigan noted here. Uh, when he did some shows with Matt Season, is that he, he was super intimidated by, especially by McCready, because he managed. They, they were both in the thick of it at the same time, and then McCready got sober and clean, and Lanigan was worse than ever. So it's kind of like looking Fuck. at what could have been if you just try, you know, worked at it. You know, for smoking, being a crackhead, I think he, I think he had a pretty great career fantastic absolutely you can yeah. only dream of having a career that great while on crack it's, it's amazing yeah it's like him an old dirty bastard that's it that is it yeah <laughs> i'm sure there's others there's whitney houston you know no yeah there's others for sure but, <laughs> but the ones we care about odb mark lanigan and even odb oh man what a what a life he liked it raw man what can i say oh. He he let you know. Oh boy, did he ever! Uh, but yeah, that's that's basically the, that's all of it. I mean, yet another grunge band that ended in tragedy, but blew up pretty quickly out of nowhere. They, I mean, they didn't play that many gigs before they went in to record that album. They they kind I, of yeah, that was fast. I guess they got the star power. They don't have to. Yeah, you know, they don't got to yeah. do the hard work. Yeah, that that bums me out because like. Ah, whatever it's fine it's a fine album all right it's a fine album I, I don't think it's fucking i think it's overrated as fuck completely but i think it's a fine album i don't i don't even know where this stands with with normal people and yeah nor do i and, yeah because it didn't uh, do well i i like it though it's it didn't change my world by any means but i was uh just like that robert redford meme like smile and, and head nod that was good yeah. i like yeah that's kind of how i am with mother love bone we just ha- yes. seem to have opposing views on every grunge band we talk about i think with time i do kind of appreciate how zany that first mother yeah. love bone album it is like the wet the fucking wackiest yeah it was before grunge was a thing it was still a little silly or just a little bit kind of glammy almost my hot Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. Oh, I'll never forget that. Check out that episode. I keep forgetting that we did a whole episode on them. That was so long ago. I would I would probably fail if I had to if I had to list every episode off the top of my head. No chance. No, we've done we've done a lot. We've done a fucking lot. Oh my god, no we've chance. done a lot. <laughs> yeah, I guess that about wraps it up. So fucking we here we we did it. We managed to do it remotely once again. Um Technology did not fail us this time. At least I don't think it has. Uh, but it's, thank you so much for listening and watching and hanging out. If you like the video, like the video, subscribe, do all that. Talk some shit in the comments. Tell us we're idiots. If you want to do that as well, you can follow me on all social media at Pounder Monkey and Alex on Instagram at 
every album alex hell yes please follow our history guy tom osmond at tom osmond sounds on all social media as well as tom sounds.com for all his music stuff he has two albums out his most recent being industrial state of mind which he put out with existent non-existent there's links to all those in the description check him out please thank you as well as my solo ep look at that as well please in the description uh last but not least of course patreon.com slash every album ever there we got bonus episodes you get to see our schedule in advance you get to vote on polls to decide who we cover next i think we have a winner for the next poll i easily uh does boy is it a decisive victory but we have a winner for the next poll we're probably going to set up another one soon um, you can also join our discord be a part of our little community it's also where you suggest our ea singles episodes we pick them all out from that uh chat thing that we have on there. It's cool. Let's go there. All right. If you're tier two, if you're bigger than Jesus, then you can suggest a full ass discography for us to cover on our bigger, longer numbered episodes. Uh, ones that are usually much longer than this one and with much more albums than this one, but still, yeah, go there for that one. Uh, it's cool. Please. Thank you. Hell yes. Okay. Well, seeing as though you liked it much more than I did, what are we closing it with Alex? You know what? This is still easy because it's long gone day. Hell yes. I couldn't agree more. So thank you so much for listening and watching. See ya.